Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining. I know it's been a long couple of days, so many wonderful sessions. Um, that uh, ADMS has curated for us, and uh, I, I applaud your uh, stamina through, the, through this time, and I hope the coffee and tea and snacks have fueled you up uh, for the sort of end of the day, the end of, end of session. Um, before I go on, I just want to thank uh, our hosts here, the ADMS Center and Julian and the, and the team for putting together this wonderful event. Uh, it's been really a sort of learning experience, meeting people, getting so many ideas, and, and uh, cross-pollinating different disciplines. I think it's been wonderful, and, and I just want to acknowledge that. Um, my name is Dave. Um, I work with the Digital Asia Hub. Uh, we're a think tank uh, based in Hong Kong, uh, but our mandate is regional. We really look at the um, growth of the internet and tech sector across Asia and its implications for society and for the economies around the world. Um, and we're really excited to be here together with my colleague Malvika, who you, who you met uh, yesterday. Um, today we, we, we started a, 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 a program called the Platform Futures, uh, and this initiative we started in 2021 uh, really to convene a network of academics and experts to create a space for dialogue and opportunities and challenges um, around the governance of tech platforms in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, we have, we're lucky to be joined by uh, three of the experts of our, from our network, uh, two on stage, Haksu and James, and also Julian uh, here with us, and we're really excited to sort of build out this program with them together. Um, we've uh, curated a program of events, case studies, and multimedia looking at uh, tech platforms in Asia. Um, in 2021, we published a series called The Small Books for Big Platforms, uh, curating critical insights into the multiplicity, potentials, and ramifications of a platform society. Um, and we invite you to visit our website, uh, platformfutures.asia, to browse through all this content uh, also to connect and follow, with us, follow us as we uh, put out more content and events over the coming uh, months. So bringing it back to, to this stage and, and to the, this panel discussion, I think in the, in the last couple of days through this uh, ADMS symposium, we've looked at you know, automated decision-making systems, we've looked at algorithmic cultures, recommendation algorithms, uh, reputation, scoring, so many different sort of uh, decision-making systems that exist. And I think it's, it's important to recognize that, you know, all of these interactions, these, these systems exist within these large pl platforms that we use every day. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's the news that we consume, uh, the entertainment that we, that we go to, um, communications with our friends, and of course, collaboration uh, more and more today as we, you know, we, we sort of uh, juggle a hybrid work, uh, offline and online work mode. And platforms are really the sort of central space now where we interact not just with other humans, but also with algorithms and with these systems. Now, here in this, in this initiative, we, we want to look at platforms as spaces in the making. So we're interested in mapping the different actors stakeholders, communities, and the users who make the platforms and create the conditions for their emergence and adoption. In this session today, we're sort of zooming out slightly. So, you know, while we've had two days of really getting into the granular detail behind the data points and the algorithms and how they work, we're sort of zooming out to look at the sort of changing power dynamics and structures globally uh, that are happening, uh, looking at how Governments in particular are training their attention to these platforms and addressing what they see as an unequal bargaining power uh, that has implications for our rights, for democracy, and for innovation. Um, regulators are uh, adopting various types of approaches uh, in trying to think about these platforms. This morning we heard from, from Karen on, on the AI Act uh, in Europe and how regulators uh, thinking about uh, AI, and of course, you know, she touched on where maybe several areas where they fall short. 
Um, and I think today we'll sort of expand more into the space of regulations and how that's evolving. Um, and one of the regular, regulatory approaches that we, we sort of pointed out that we see going around is this ex-ante and ex-post form of regulations. Um, before we go on, maybe it's good to get a sure of hand. How many people here are familiar with this idea of ex-ante, ex-post style of regulations? Great, we got a few hands, but, but maybe for, for general framing, we can sort of uh, lay a quick context for, for what, what the ex-ante and ex-post uh, uh, framing is. I want to hear from all these folks, so I'm going to be really quick. Um, you can think of it as before and after very, very fundamentally. Uh, so for those who aren't aware, ex ante is usually when you're regulating in anticipation of harms that could occur, whereas ex post is where some kind of harm has already been evidenced, where uh, there's been a shift in the market, where you can actually look at effects, and then it's an effects-based enforcement action after the fact. So I think part of the concern that arises now is if you're anticipating things that haven't happened yet, and you're trying to set the ground rules. How are you actually balancing competing considerations? Is that regulation pitched at the right level? Is it too onerous? Can everyone comply? So I think that's why we're, we're framing this panel in terms of looking at the benefits and the cons of both, both types of approaches. Thanks, and, and, we're, we're, and we're excited to be joined by such an array of, of experts from around the world, including uh, Karen, who's Melcher, who's joining us uh, online on Zoom, and we'll introduce Karen uh, right after our first speaker. Um, so I think we'll kick it off uh, with someone who I, all of you in this room are certainly very familiar with, uh, James Meese, who is a uh, senior lecturer here at the uh, RMIT, uh, where he researches media law and policy. Uh, James has done a lot of uh, space and pioneering work, I would say, in, in looking at Australia's work around the media bargaining code which um, has been a hot topic here in Australia, and I think it's come up also in, in discussions over the last couple of days. Um, so James is going to kick us off, I think, with looking at the bargaining code, where it originated from, and taking us through a timeline of development since then, and then, yeah, and then sort of tying into the ex-ante approaches and, and, and global developments. So um, with that, I'll turn, turn over to you, James. Yeah, happy to. Um, well, it's quite funny that um, the bargaining code has taken on a particular Australian flavour, because really, as many of the people in this room would be aware, the, the debates are quite old, that, you know, from the 2010s onwards and even earlier, uh, Europe and um, a number of countries in Europe, from Spain to Belgium, have been trying to get Google, in particular, to, to pay for news after Google News was set up, and that, that model of aggregation raised questions about whether or not search engines, in particular, could take content from uh, new sites and, and use it without without payment. Now, um, that's kind of useful background, I think, um, because obviously uh, that didn't go anywhere, really. That um, It seems that, it, particularly in the, the market at the time, uh, news organisations, which were very much focused on traffic, were more interested in getting that traffic from, from Google rather than pressuring them into some sort of deals. And the argument could be said that the regulatory infrastructure wasn't there to secure any payments anyway. Now, a few years later, you know, I guess a decade later, Australia has a digital platforms inquiry, which, um, you know, kicks off in the late 2010s, and we asked a lot of very big questions. You know, I, I like, I think I remember when it, when it started, it, it was almost like the Australian Consumer, uh, uh, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission was asking the question of the internet money, how does this work, you know? Um, and I think that's really important to frame because, you know, there is a kind of presumption that the HCC inquiry started off with the, the goal of securing money from, from platforms for news, but in actual fact, you know, that was clearly maybe on the radar, but um, it really wasn't a major policy sort of narrative. And I think um, my colleague, Jake Goldenfine, who's, who's not here today, um, has a wonderful kind of detailed study of the submissions and the, the kind of policy process. And we really see that this idea doesn't come into the picture until after the completion of the UK Can Cross Review, which was a similar, slightly more targeted inquiry, which was more focused on the sustainability of journalism in the United Kingdom. 
they floated the idea of a code of conduct. And then surprise, surprise, the HCCC thinks it's a great idea. That idea starts to be floated in um, stakeholder consultations later on the review. And it emerges as a voluntary code of conduct. Now, as part of that process, the HCCC identifies, as, as you kind of suggested, Dave, uh, a market imbalance, that, that there is a market imbalance between platforms and publishers, that this is unfair, and that this power imbalance should somehow be remedied. Um, implicit in this analysis is the presumption that the press, to some extent, are dependent on platforms for revenues because platforms have, suffered, have such significant audience um, capacity and that a significant funnel for traffic for news publishers is through platforms. Now, I think we can put that to one side for a moment, but it's really interesting to think about whether like, the extent to which that's true um, now and, um, yeah, the kind of existing market conditions that, that may make that possible. Um, then COVID hit, and, and as we saw, uh, news organisations across the world lost, lost lots of money because when there's a recession, one of the first things to go is advertising. So the government steps in and says, well, this voluntary code is now mandatory. Um, as part of that process, I don't really want to get into the, the kind of um, detailed what happened next because that's quite complicated. I, I'm really more interested in talking about the outcomes at this point. But through this process, we get to a point where despite this complicated um, regulatory architecture, which requires things like forced arbitration, um, designation of platforms by the minister and so on, none of that is actually realised in the practice of implementing the legislation. Um, the, the, the now almost banal phrase, because it's said so many times, is that the regulation functions like a sort of Damocles because the threat of um, arbitration is so present to platforms, they, the government kind of came around and said, look, as long as you can do deals with, with publishers and give them some money, you know, we won't use this much more kind of heavier form of regulatory enforcement. Now, I find that quite interesting on one level because platforms were already giving money to certain news organisations. So that's something to, to note. We might now turn to the outcomes, and since this reform, We've had about roughly $200 million per annum given to Australian news organisations. Google's done 37 deals from some of Australia's largest uh, multi-platform news organisations to things like the Australian Chinese Daily or the Australian Jewish News. Meta has done 14, and it's really notable that they've put a full stop at that 14, I think it's fair to say, and they're not willing to negotiate further. Whether the government will introduce designation to encourage them and, and essentially force them, I guess, to, to negotiate with more news organisations is open to consideration. Um, this is old data when Google had done less deals, but uh, the Public Interest Journalism Initiative estimates that about 61% of Australian uh, news organisations are covered by these existing deals. Um, a few other notes, the deals are secret, they're commercial and confident, so they're not publicly known. All of this numbers that I'm throwing around are uh, based on rumours and hearsay. And we can think about things like $30 million per annum or more for large companies and small regional outlets. We're looking at maybe $31,000 to $62,000 per year. It's not really clear how that money or that value proposition has come, come to be. Um, I can talk more, and, and I think we'll talk about this later, it's being exported to other countries now. So it's ironic that even though Europe and the UK maybe started this process originally, whether that was in the early 2010s or later on with the Cancross Review, it's only after Australia has implemented this reform that Europe, um, a number of countries in Europe, as well as the Commission itself, Canada and so on, are starting to look towards this model. If I've got a bit more time, I do just want to add one more thing, and I think it's that there's a focus, I think, internationally on the code, but I think that also ignores the wonderful work that the HCCC is doing in other areas, because what the Digital Platform Inquiry really did was not just this quite, you know, basic value transfer, but essentially set up a watching brief on platforms. 
So we have the digital platform services inquiry, which has, you know, is open now, looking at competition market trends, uh, harm, consumer harm and international development. So they've done inquiries on online advertising services, online retail marketplaces, competition in the internet search and so on. So I think it's really interesting in a way that while the focus is on the code, I think there's been much less focus on, in a way, a much richer regulatory analysis of platform economics. Um, in, a, in association with that, uh, Australia's privacy law is also under review and um, you know, that's quite a dated legislative framework and that also emerged from the digital platforms inquiry as well. We've got a misinformation code as well. So I think there's, there, there's more that's come out of this digital platforms inquiry than just the code. And I think that kind of sets a broader agenda for uh, yeah, Australia's platform regulation. Excellent. Thank you, James. I think that was really important to bring us up to speed. And we'll definitely want to get into some of the global uh, implications and connections which you touched on as it's being exported. Um, I think next we want to look at what's happening in Europe. And there's been, July has been a landmark month, really, as we saw two big acts, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, uh, passed just two weeks ago. Um, and these are going to have uh, what we expect uh, quite significant implications for how large tech platforms operate in Europe and, and perhaps uh, globally as well. And we're l really lucky to be joined um, by Karen Melcher. Um, she's a Danish member of the European Parliament, uh, where a lot of her activities look at participating in consumer protection and the internal market in, in the EU. And a lot of her work is focused on uh, technology, AI regulation, consumer protection, uh, which is a big part of, of her work in the European Parliament. And I think she's going to give us a really important view on, on, uh, on the motivations and the implications and the mood on the ground uh, joining us live from Brussels. Um, so thank you so much, Karen, for joining us early in the morning. Uh, we're really grateful, and uh, I'll uh, turn over the mic to you. Thank you very much, Dev, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm sorry to have missed uh, the last couple of days that you've had. It sounds like it's been a, a great conference. The, um, the legislative package that we've just uh, agreed to was passed by the European Parliament, where we have legislators from all of the member states of the European Union. And it's been a proposal that was made by the European Commission, which is selected by the governments. And we have been negotiating with the governments of the, each individual member state. So this is like a, a kind of a patchwork legislation that will apply to all of the European Union, but is sort of European in scale. And that's why it's the European Parliament has been involved as a co-legislator with the Commission. And what the motivation has been uh, is the last 20 years, we've seen how the internet has developed from being a quite even playing field with blogs and um, email lists and to being dominated by a few global players uh, that have been using platforms which have changed the way that the internet works and how we we function in it um we've also seen developments of illegal activity uh going online and legislators wanting to make sure that what is illegal offline should also be legal online for me as a legislator it is also important that we make sure that this does not mean that um fundamental freedoms will be um, suppressed. And also that we don't use excessive tools in order to uh, make sure what's illegal offline is illegal online. Because the tools that you use online have a very different um, effect than when you do something for a newspaper or um, what you can put on posters on the streets. And that is in the Digital Services Act, where that is mainly being applied. The Digital Markets Act is trying to look at making sure that we have fair markets also when we're looking at digital markets. Because what we've seen is that having competition online and digitally 
is very different than having competition if you are selling um, uh, shoes or uh, widgets or something that is physical that needs transport and needs production and, and, and stores. You have the network effect of uh, if you have more users, then it will bring more users in and that makes it very difficult for somebody that has a better service or a better product to actually compete with uh, a very large platform or network, uh, even if what you're proposing is better, just because of the size, it's very difficult to compete. And that's why we have the Digital Markets Act, which has allowed for not waiting for the damage to be done, but actually having um, a well-defined set of obligations and prohibitions for the, the very large um, businesses, uh, gatekeeper platforms, as they're called, uh, so that we make sure that they don't destroy the competition before they even get off the ground. This um, is making sure that we have the possibility of companies that have the best ideas will actually be able to uh, to prosper. If we look at what is unique about the way we're doing it now is also that the European Commission will be the primary regulator for these very large online platforms, both regarding digital services, which is more the content on the platforms and also the competition on the platforms. And this is different from the data, the personal data protection uh, regulation that we've had in the, in the EU before the GDPR, where it was more um, delegated out to the individual member states and their, um, and their regulators. I'm sure you've all seen the pictures of the, the data um, protecting regulator in, in Ireland where a lot of the digital platforms are based, uh, which was a small shop across a, um, a, um, a supermarket. And that was trying to regulate everything in the European Union because large platforms were regulated there. We, we need to make sure that the European market is regulated and enforced uh, at a European scale. And that is what uh, the Digital Markets Act bring in. For the Digital Services Act, it has also opened up the way that the platforms are working with a reporting obligation to the European Commission and making sure that we have um, transparency and accountability of what the platforms are doing, sort of a responsibility by design rather than moving on from the GDPR's uh, privacy by design. We've also put in a, a ban on dark patterns, uh, which is uh, trying to manipulate users and consumers in um, making choices that they would not have made otherwise, sort of consumer protection online. Furthermore, we have made a um, um, know your business customer obligation for the platforms so that if you have a seller online, that you, uh, you as a platform have an obligation to keep track of who the seller of illegal or dangerous goods is. But this is a contrast to having an obligation of everybody having their um, real life identity, their identity cards being used to identify them when online. And for me, this has been one of the balances to be struck to make sure that we protect both consumers and users and citizens online uh, while also protecting um, fundamental freedoms and, and rights. Um, because what the effect will be of the European legislation is that it will apply to everybody offering their services in, in Europe for the Digital Services Act. So even if you're based in Hong Kong or if you're based in Australia or in China, in the rest of China, then you will, um, you will be uh, asked to uh, apply this European legislation and also to have legal representation in, in the EU.
So as a legislator in the European Union, it's been important for me to make sure that the legislation cannot be misused both by companies and also by, by authorities so that we have a balanced approach in, in the way that they are being applied. Um, it's important to underline that these are horizontal um, pieces of legislation that apply to all uh, platforms and all forms of platforms. So both um, if you have short term rental, if you are selling products or if you are sharing uh, user created content online, this legislation will be applied um, and that also says that it, it doesn't solve all of the problems in one piece of legislation. There will be a follow-up with a Media Freedom Act in the fall, which will try and address some of the imbalances uh, in the media market, and also try and ensure uh, diversity in the media providers in, in Europe. And it's also being followed up by general product safety um, regulation so that we make sure that the products that are being put on the market are safe. But there has been some frustration that the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act haven't solved all problems in the digital sphere yet. But these are first steps. And what is unique about them in a sort of on a global scale is that it is actual legislation that will be, be able to be enforced. A lot of the codes of conduct that have been uh, put forward uh, in different parts of the world so far have been codes of conduct. They have been voluntary. Um, what, we, what we see in the digital sphere as well as in the physical is that legislation and enforced legislation is much more effective than um, appealing to people's better conscience. And that's why, why I see uh, the pieces of legislation that we've um, agreed to in Europe this summer uh, are historic and will have a, a better effect than the code of conduct that we've seen so far. I think that will be a, an introduction from, uh, from Brussels and I'm looking forward to, to listening to the rest of the speakers and to the discussion later. Thank you so much, Karen. I think there was a lot of themes that we want to uh, dive deeper into, especially the gatekeepers and, and those roles, uh, which we'll get into in the, in the next stage of discussion. Um, with that, I'm going to move to our third speaker today and moving to a country which, uh, unlike Australia and maybe Europe, but similar to China and South Korea, both countries that have large platforms, uh, domestic local platforms, uh, which is a very different dynamic as far as uh, regulation and jurisdiction is concerned. Um, Haksu is a professor of law at the Seoul National University um, at School of Law in South Korea. Um, he conducts a lot of research around data privacy and the AI laws, um, and he works very closely with uh, various stakeholders, including government, uh, into how uh, South Korea's internet and technology landscape is evolving. So we're really lucky to be joined Haksu uh, coming in from Seoul and um, Haksu, yeah, he, uh, please uh, over to you. Thank you, uh, thank you the, uh, for a very nice introduction. Um, yeah, as mentioned, I'll uh, talk about uh, experiences uh, in Korea and try to draw implications for other uh, uh, countries. Um, as mentioned, uh, Korea has a few uh, unique uh, characteristics uh, and first one would be that um, Korea has its own um, uh, technology industry and large uh, uh, platforms at the same time uh, global uh, big tech companies are also uh, very active uh, in Korea so there's this uh, dimension of uh, tension uh, involving global big tech companies and also uh, Korean big tech companies and again uh, smaller startups. So um, if we emphasize uh, cosmopolitan and global aspect, uh, there will be uh, some group of stakeholders who complain about uh, uh, not uh, giving enough consideration of uh, local uh, aspect or localities and, and vice versa. And um, the second 
characteristic uh, that you can see in Korea and perhaps in many other countries is uh, nowadays if there are uh, proposals for new uh, uh, regulations or new uh, statutes somewhere, then uh, that kind of new proposals are introduced and, and translated um, almost real time. Uh, in particular, the past several years, um, you know, EU's effort, uh, GDPR, and the uh, last year or so, uh, as mentioned, uh, DSA, DMA, that kind of uh, legal uh, statutory proposals are uh, mentioned like constantly in Korea too, not just within the EU. Um, and, and in terms of regulating uh, uh, platforms, um, not just DMA and DSA, but also uh, P2B regulation, which was enacted a couple of years ago within the EU, was mentioned a lot in Korea. And, and, and uh, well, those of you who, would, uh, who follow uh, this sphere would know after the P2B regulation was enacted, there was uh, a guideline published, which is called uh, tra Algorithmic Transparency Guideline. Uh, so that kind of guidelines were also uh, referenced a lot in Korea. So uh, some of the uh, uh, government agencies or some of the uh, members of national uh, legislature, they uh, looked up uh, this kind of uh, legislative campaigns in other countries and, and, and sometimes they try to emulate and then uh, obviously uh, controversies uh, uh, arise. And third aspect that I uh, consider maybe unique about Korea or maybe not, I don't know, uh, but um, you know, anything on platform or anything on data or AI, these are very uh, hotly debated. And at the same time, from uh, uh, the perspective of regulatory agencies, this is where the future lies. So uh, that means they want to uh, uh, set their foot in this area. So uh, there are uh, bound to be some sort of turf battles uh, among uh, different regulatory uh, agencies. So uh, in the case of Korea, uh, competition authority, they, have, uh, they showed keen interest in uh, setting foot in this area. Uh, and Korean uh, Communication Commission, uh, which regulates uh, the media industry in general, they uh, propose their own uh, set of regulations. The Ministry of Science and ICT, they tr well, uh, try to uh, uh, show themselves as mediator among uh, different stakeholders. So uh, uh, one of the results of this kind of uh, 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 various uh, regulatory agencies showing interest is uh, Polistora. Uh, multiple uh, proposals of legis legislation. Um, and and uh, what we saw last year in Korea was just, you know, uh, about five uh, legislative proposals and uh, different uh, regu regulatory agencies, they, they were just adamant uh, about their own proposals and uh, we were stuck. Uh, and then uh, we had presidential election uh, 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 a few months ago, and now uh, the newly elected president and the administration is saying that, well, uh, uh, start from scratch, basically, and, and we are looking to the possibilities of uh, having some sort of uh, self-regulation but no one knows for sure what self-regulation means uh, in this context. So um, in pretty much uh, many uh, difficult and big questions are uh, up in the air right now. Um, and and in, in more broadly uh, as to how to uh, see uh, the big tech or platform uh, in general, still we are kind of, we have uh, multiple, uh, multiple questions that are that we can ask, uh, but uh, we are 
right now at the stage we just are collecting and, and compiling questions rather than uh, uh, finding uh, 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 good solutions. Um, so a few uh, implications that I myself uh, am um, drawing from uh, Korea's experiences would be the following. There I would be uh, uh, saying maybe it's three or four items. Uh, first, uh, uh, as an extension of uh, what uh, Karen Ng uh, said uh, this morning at, at the symposium, um, there is tension or difference between uh, preparing a statute uh, uh, versus uh, preparing uh, guidelines. Statute, uh, by definition, is explicit, uh, oftentimes based on principles and oftentimes uh, a statute uh, contain vague uh, uh, notions. Uh, guidelines, uh, on the other hand, could be flexible, uh, may be more practical, and may be more practicable. But uh, the downside would be there may not be clear uh, statutory or legal mandate. Uh, so there, there, are, there are dynamics involving, you know, these two types, you know, you know, having a statute and having a guideline. Um, and stakeholders, uh, depending on their interest, they have uh, different interests uh, as to, you know, between the two, which uh, would suit their need better. Uh, but, you know, it's difficult to have a uh, 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 good side uh, from both. The second uh, uh, lesson that I learned is there is really big blur. Uh, so there, you know, um, the media industry, the kind of boundary is becoming uh, 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 more kind of blur than before. But not just within the media industry, but uh, say if you have platform service now, you may, you know, some of the platforms, they be may begin uh, uh, having uh, offering a shopping service, uh, and then they may want to uh, uh, begin servicing payment. And then they may want to go into financial industry and, and have the whole uh, banking service within their platform. So uh, in the past, uh, there, there are, relatively speaking, there is clear distinction among different industries. But nowadays, uh, the distinction is becoming more blurry and hard to make distinctions. So uh, a natural, one of the natural outshot would be uh, like each company, with, with each big platform company kind of trying to step into others' uh, territory. And then, and then uh, from the regulatory perspective, uh, uh, tensions and, 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 and turf battle among different uh, agencies. And the third uh, lesson that I learned was um, there's all sorts of different uh, levels of understanding as to how things work. Uh, if we talk about, for example, uh, algorithm, some people, you know, have very vague notion of what algorithm is, or some people just don't know what it is. On the other hand, some people know very, you know, very well how it works. So, for example, uh, in a regular uh, uh, recommender system, uh, an algorithm, a you know one big uh, 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 type of uh, algorithm is uh, called uh, collaborative filtering. And some people know what it is, how it works. Some people just had no idea what it, how it works. And and um, you know, if with different levels of understanding. It, sometimes very difficult to engage in uh, constructive dialogue. Um, and the final lesson uh, that I learned uh, is it's very difficult to build trust. I mean, I, my view is trust is, after all, uh, the, the crucial concept here, just in, in partly because this is an emerging and, and also rapidly changing area. And for example, when we talk about algorithmic uh, transparency, um, one concern uh, would be that uh, from a defensive side, uh, once we reveal some of the characteristics of the algorithm, 
then what's the next? Uh, there would be slippery slope uh, that would be kind of uh, uh, concerned or defensive side. And uh, if there's no trust, uh, they, you know, once you have that kind of anxiety, uh, they don't see the end in sight. So once we begin showing what we have uh, from our algorithmic uh, uh, side, then we may, after all, have to show uh, not just the principles or key characteristics, but the raw uh, source code. And that's uh, something in, in, uh, in, in imagine, not in imaginable. Uh, so, how to build trust, that's uh, 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 crucial uh, uh, concern, I think. And um, to conclude, uh, to get back to the title of the session, uh, of, of, uh, you know, distinguishing between uh, ex ante and ex post, uh, um, I would add one uh, uh, additional uh, flavor, which is not about uh, like beforehand, after the fact, uh, kind of traditional distinction, but also um, having this distinction would give a flavor as to what is taking place. Uh, we talk about uh, the notion of context uh, in privacy, or data, AI. Uh, we often say context matters. And, and then next question is what context? Uh, if we consider ex post aspect, we can have a more concrete uh, situation. So that could give you a flavor of what uh, context means in, the, uh, in this uh, area. Uh, with that, I, I conclude. Thank you so much, Aksu. I think that touched on many flashpoints and uh, important conclusions and uh, understandings from, from Seoul. Um, Finally, we want to move to uh, another country with uh, known for l very large platforms. Um, China has been very busy in the last 16 months with a whole series of anti-monopoly, algorithmic governance, and other regulations that are impacting the large platforms and the big industries there. And we're really delighted to, to be joined by uh, Hai Ching, who uh, can share a, a strong overview into what's happening in China and how this connects. Hai Ching is, of course, another one familiar to all of you here, a professor for media and communication at RMIT and um, researches the cultural impact of China's uh, digital media and communication and the technology culture in China. So we're really uh, lucky and delighted. And Hai Ching, uh, over to you. Thanks. Um, thanks for the invitation to be on the panel. Um, Yes, China, the big elephant in the room. Um, I'm, I have to say, I look at the platform regulation in the Chinese context, not because I'm a legal studies scholar, which I'm not, uh, and I don't do you know, media law studies at all. I look at it from a platform governance perspective, and you know, I, I, I try to draw reference to the other speakers, particularly in the Korea and the uh, Australian context. Um, you know, platform regulation has been a global trend. Lots of countries in the world have been, you know, trying to figure out how to regulate, uh, not just you know, from the internet, but now it's more platform. But firstly, I'd like to see what is a platform, how is platform is understood in a Chinese context? Because, you know, you can look at platform as business, as market. You can look at it as technological infrastructure. You can look at it from the Chinese pers perspective as digital utility, public facility, and digital infrastructure, but also part and parcel of China's effort to innovate its governance. So when, therefore, when we look at platform governance, we don't just look at what uh, Gillies has pointed out, governance of platforms and gov governance by platform, but in the Chinese context, there's also governance with platforms. Um, but for today, because of the time limit, I'm going to just focus on uh, governance of platforms, okay? Um, in, you know, China has been, in the past, focused on regulating access to the internet within its borders uh, by the Great Firewall and the content censorship using both uh, uh, AI and, and the human senses. But in, since 2017, particularly in the last couple of years, the effort has increasingly moved to 
from regulating content and access to regulated, regulating data, data flow across borders, and the data localization within the Chinese border, uh, borders, and how recommendation systems can be used by platforms. And, and that, you know, I think, uh, like the Korean, South Korean case, is part of the process of China watching and learning uh, what's happening in the world, particularly uh, Euro-American context. So uh, lots of the laws uh, that I have gone through, uh, they recently have been issued by the Chinese government, actually modeled upon GDPR. And they also look at what's, what the US government has been governing its own platforms, which are global platforms, more global than the Chinese platforms. Unlike uh, the South Korea case where all the different ministries were uh, in a turf war in terms of regulation, uh, China has now, well, it, that's the case actually in the, Chinese, uh, in, in the Chinese context more than 10 years ago. There was also turf war among the ministries in terms of regulating, governing the different internet spaces. But now there is a big, super powerful agency called Cyberspace Administration of China. It's headed directly by Xi Jinping himself. And that agency, uh, it's called CAC, CSA, C, has issued quite a, a few uh, laws and regulations, in to, in, mainly in two major uh, areas. One is the anti-monopoly, uh, the other is in uh, data, data uh, security and the personal information protection laws. Okay, so as I said before, I'm not a lawyer, not a legal studies scholar, so I really, uh, they, I, when I read the legal documents, I'm, I don't really understand lots of the jargons, uh, particularly when the jargons are addressed in the socialist ideology terms. Really difficult to read. Um, so I read that to understand the context. Okay, so I already talked about China's reference to what's happening in the world, but mainly the context is in the last two years, the Sino-US tech code war. And that actually has waken up Chinese regulators, particularly in terms of data, in terms of data across border data flow. Uh, and and you know, the use of digital technologies, platforms, and algorithms in social governance through systems such as the social credit system or, or the health code system that has been implemented in the last two years. Okay, so firstly, let's look at the anti-monopoly guidelines for platform economies. That was issued, firstly, actually quite a long time ago uh, in 20, uh, 2008, but in 2020, there's a new guideline on anti-monopoly for platform economies. And then now there's a revised version of anti-monopoly law, which will be effect, take effect uh, on 1st of August this year. So that, that law uh, strengthens legal regulation of the platform economy, uh, particularly in combating uh, monopoly and unfair market competitions. It has levied uh, fines against China's big tech giants, including Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, uh, and ByteDance for violating antitrust laws. It also restricts overseas listings by Chinese companies. Um, such as, you know, last end of uh, 2020, uh, China's she personally intervened to stop and finance financial the IPO in the U.S. market. In July this 2021, uh, the. Uh, the Chinese regulator also uh, levied anti-monopoly fines against the DD, China's Uber, New York stock market listing uh, over data security. Uh, so in order to list private corporations in overseas markets, particularly the US market, uh, the state regulators has to approve. And that's why TikTok was not allowed to sell to the US, to any US company in uh, 2020. Um, and then in 2021, 
Uh, there are two more famous laws uh, were that were issued. One is the data security law. The other, the other is the personal information protection law. And both were built upon the 2017 cybersecurity law. Cyber, the 2017 cybersecurity law mainly focused on data localization, which is a common practice around the world. Basically says, you know, a business operating in China would have to store Chinese citizens' data in China, not in the US or elsewhere. Um, but this new uh, data security law and uh, personal information protection law expand upon those previous ones to uh, expand the data localization and the data uh, transfer laws to impose harsher penalties for violation and the violations. Companies must ensure that all data gathered within China is, in, is stored uh, within the country and that all data handlers are prohibited from providing any data stored in China to foreign government agencies without, without approval from the Chinese government authorities, regardless of data security level and where the data was originally collected. So that data security law was, has been viewed as a countermeasure to the US 2018 Cloud Act. The cloud means clarifying law for overseas use of data, which gives US law enforcement agencies legal right to demand access to electronic data no matter which country the data is stored in. Basically, China was, say, it was saying, well, US, you can do that, I can do that too. Um, okay, so the personal pr information protection law was modeled upon the EU's GDPR. Uh, it was China's first comprehensive data protection law covering personal data collection and transfer by public and the private companies. And I had to read that law because during, in the ethics approval process at MIT, <laughs> I had to address the issue how I could, you know, how uh, ensure that I comply with the data security law and the China's new personal information protection law. And I, I had to make it clear that, you know, this is, I'm not a public company or a private company. I'm not use, transferring large quantity of Chinese citizen status to Australia for commercial purposes. Uh, so I, I read it uh, just to make sure that I'm all safe. Um, I won't go into more details. So I want, to, what I want to say, you know, that China has now joined the EU as a major economy um, with comprehensive data governance framework, uh, but how it is implemented and enforced is another question. And that's the question that lots of lawyers have asked. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, as in yesterday's panel, I mentioned uh, the new uh, algorithm regulation law, which it was issued in March 2022 this year. Mm. And then following that, in April, uh, the Chinese government also issued uh, another uh, algorithm uh, uh, regulations called the Qinglang 2022 Algorithm Comprehensive Governance. It outlaws algorithmic discrimination as part of what may be the world's most ambitious effort to regulate artificial intelligence. So, all right, just very briefly, the new regulation addressed a range of issues involved algorithms from addiction or excessive consumption and the synthetic of false news information to the protection of the elderly uh, and the gig workers. And under the rules, uh, the uh, companies will be prohibited from using personal information to offer different prices for the same product or service. They will be required to notify the users when algorithms are used to make recommendations and the users have the option to op opt out. Okay, the, reinforce, the, the, the enforcement uh, is mainly on the company's self-evaluation and the self-correction. So the corporate public responsibility has been emphasized here. But there are also you know, uh, other measures in, in terms of uh, fines, uh, barring uh, stopping the companies from enrolling new users, having their license, business license pulled out, and having the website or apps uh, shut down, etc. So those are part of um, the uh, effort. But at its core, the regulation requires providers to uphold mainstream value and 
or mainstream value orientations and vigorously disseminate positive energy. So those, those are what I see or what I said about those socialist, communist, ideological terms. You, you might wonder what does it mean, you know, mainstream value orientations and the positive energies. Basically, they are just what the CCP says, okay? What the party says, you have to uphold that. It's, you can't question that. Um, so, um, what I want to summarize just for takeaways, one, as I said before, tightening in platform regulation is a global trend as most countries have passed data protection laws, etc. Uh, there are a lot of this impact on companies working in the global economy, cross borders. So basically, each company working in each nation state would have to hire local lawyers to make sure they comply with local laws. In the Chinese context, yeah, makes it even harder for transnational corporations to operate there. Two, platform governance is increasingly focused on data security and data sovereignty, and both concern governing and regulating data and digital infrastructure. Um, and data sovereignty is now promoted in the name of personal data protection to counter the US, so-called US data colonialism. I'm going to quote an article in the Global Times uh, published this year, not long ago. I quote, restricting data export is Beijing's only current means to fight Washington's data hegemony. We must first protect our own data security so that we can have the strength to promote the establishment of a fair international order on data. In addition, China should work with the EU to break the monopoly of the US internet giant we cannot let data become a tool for the U.S. to exploit, exploit other countries, end quote. So what's the impact of the China effect? China hasn't, doesn't have a model yet. It is still exploring how to govern its platform uh, it, because technologies are evolving so quickly. The governance regime has to uh, keep up. But as China plays a bigger role in the global data market and the transnational data governance, the Chinese way of regulating platforms, data, and algorithms is closely watched by most countries and maybe secretly copied by some, particularly the authoritarian regimes. I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you, Hai Ching. Um, I would love to come back to your last point later about the influence of China in the region as opposed to what China is copying from other countries especially culturally, as you were saying, the context in which the China model is seen as more appealing to certain governments and certain kinds of uh, not so democratic countries. Um, but first, I want to go back to Karen. Uh, I'm sure you've never had to use the words positive energy in any kind of legislation that you've drafted <laughs> or helped with. But I think Hai Ching talked a lot about enforcement. And I think that's one of the sort of big questions that's being asked after the DSA and DMA packages um, were, were passed. Um, it's going to take a lot of resources to enforce something this ambitious that's you know, being touted as a landmark for all kinds of reasons. Um, and, and I know Thierry Breton has written a piece recently trying to get ahead of that about what the, you know, what the process is going to be, but I wonder if you could talk to us about likely enforcement uh, options to give teeth to these new pieces of legislation. The challenge really also is that we don't only have the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act. We also have an AI Act that we're negotiating at the moment. We will have a data act uh, to be negotiated in the fall. So we have a lot of different pieces of digital legislation that will need to be enforced. And with the sort of patchwork nature of the way that the European Union is enforces legislation, it can become quite a, a challenge if it's up to uh, member states to, to enforce the European legislation. I think the oversight structure, which has the commission as a primary regulator for the very on, large online platforms is a good starting point uh, to try and have a centralized body that will set out the um, 
the standards and the enforcements, especially for the, the large platforms. We also have a couple of EU agencies that do work on digital, um, digital security. And then we also have the, um, the data uh, supervisor uh, that also uh, gives out advice and oversees the, the uh, General Data Protection Board. And one of the challenges uh, will be having resources enough to hire the, the people that are needed to uphold the enforcement. Um, we have already a, a fight for the, the competences, the, the people that know about um, regulation and also how the algorithms work. As was also mentioned by one of the panelists, it's an understanding of, of how things work is crucial in order to actually enforce the legislation. And I think that is going to be one of the, the biggest challenges is making sure that we can attract the necessary talent and also make sure that the, the decisions being made are enforced in similar ways across the European Union. Um, listening to the Chinese experiences of um, of uh, turf wars and also in Korea. We're not being censored, are we? We're not being censored, no. Uh, but it's uh, we. Everybody wanted to to be the ones that were. were um, had the pen in their hand on writing the legislation and we're fighting about that. And I hope that we will, now that we've written the legislation, that the enforcement will, there'll be less turf wars there, but there will be a war for resources. And part of the challenge is that a lot of the resources will have to come from the member states in order to make sure that, um, that we get, uh, get it in the next seven year budget that will be negotiated in about two or three years. Mm -hmm. I hope thank that answered you. your questions. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Haksu, you brought up this sort of very nice frame of the, of the blurring between the agencies. Uh, on my flight over here, I was watching the first episode of this series about Uber and Travis Kalanick called uh, Super Pumped. And there's a moment where um, they're trying to fight the sort of medallions and the, you know, the turf war between people trying to regulate taxi cabs versus ride sharing. And that's the moment at which they come up with this ride sharing idea. And he says, oh, so we're not a taxi company any longer. And this new financial advisor says, you never were. <laughs> and I think that kind of, you know, the, the sort of workarounds that you do to either fall within a regulatory bracket because that's more compelling or you know lower bar uh, to comply with versus being regulated by a different authority that might also have jurisdiction and you know where these overlaps have really weird effects um, I think I would I would love to ask you a little more about uh, about that and connecting it to the sort of ex ante ex post thing are there particular circumstances or conditions for a market where one approach or other might be more useful um, in Korea's example or broadly in, in the region? Why would you go for an ex-ante approach? Um, well, they, they are excellent questions or points. Uh, first of all, the Uber case that you mentioned, um, there, there was a big controversy in Korea as well. Um, and Uber, is in operation in Korea, but in a very small scale. And a few years ago, uh, there, there were a lot of controversies involving, uh, well, broadly speaking, uh, mobility uh, services. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there were um, um, like uh, protests uh, from uh, traditional uh, taxi businesses. And, um, the controversy was so severe so that at the time uh, the government, um, the ministry in charge, Ministry of Transport, um, 
just sided with traditional uh, taxi businesses. And then voila, after uh, the COVID hit, um, taxis, you know, uh, drivers uh, disappeared pretty much. And this year, um, demand for taxi services exploded. And then, well, um, there are just not uh, many uh, taxi cabs around. And now the government is saying that uh, we uh, try to uh, induce uh, more of, uh, you know, uh, sharing services or Uber-like services. So now the question is, uh, a few years back, why didn't we consider this kind of possibilities? Mm -hmm. Why couldn't we be more proactive and, and perspective? And, and, you know, uh, that's inherently about uh, how we engage in dialogues among different stakeholders and, and who would be uh, accountable for what. Uh, in, you know, after all, this is uh, social dialogue and at the same time, uh, political dialogue and it's very uh, challenging in this uh, constantly changing environment how how to uh, make a projection about what will happen in a few in a few years of time uh, but you know taxi drivers who used to be a taxi driver maybe three years ago now uh, some of them are uh, uh, in the business of uh, delivery but not people but more of uh, delivery of overnight uh, uh, food items and that kind of uh, deliveries. And that so for some people, that has more kind of attraction. Um, and now, you know, with that more broader question that you raised uh, uh, between axi anti and ex post, um, the general theory ex anti uh, discussion is oftentimes better than ex post because uh, if ex ante, we can set principles and we can have dialogue based on the principles instead of uh, uh, go going into uh, interest. Um, I mean, once stakeholders begin to shape and begin to have their own interests, uh, it's hard to engage in dialogue and, and, and have, uh, you know, uh, like uh, make, have asked them to have some sort of sacrifice in return for some sort of gains uh, for everyone else. Uh, so in that respect, ex ante is better. Uh, but in reality, in this area of, you know, uh, changing environment, uh, ex ante is very difficult because who knows, you know, as the Uber uh, or mobility service case uh, shows wh what's going to happen when COVID could hit and then demand for mobility service would go up or the platform service, whether some of the platform services, they want to provide shopping services. Some of them may want to provide matching service for mobility or, you know, delivery service. Well, each platform has its own different uh, business uh, agenda and hard to make prediction. And, and uh, you know, having ex post uh, discussion would give more concrete uh, uh, ideas and more concrete uh, items uh, for uh, discussion and, and trade among stakeholders. So uh, in, if we uh, consider that kind of uncertainty, uh, ex post dis discussion could uh, make some sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, Haksu. Um, if I come back to James now, um, I, I know that in the discourse there's been a lot of talk about copy pasting, you know, the sort of Australia approach. But I wonder if my, I might turn that around a little and say, in, in your mind, like, what's missing from the discourse? Like, this is a very binary copy Australia versus reject it. It, are there, is there more nuance? Are there things we should be thinking of? And but perhaps the other question is, where do you see like the biggest gap between what companies' interests are and what consumers could benefit from? And how could we possibly even bring those uh, together in some way? Oh, the, the second one's a big one, so I'll start with the first, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, I think um, 
the in terms of copy pasting i think the challenge is that uh, you're very much to your point i think the discourse particularly i think at the regulatory level has become quite stratified and you've got a series of stakeholders whether it you know it, whether it's um regulators against big tech in capital letters or whether it's platforms against publishers and so on and so forth and you know i think um part of this moment and i was you know i could basically crib notes from the book launch of everyday data cultures because um those people and some of them in the room now said it so well but i think it's really true that there's been an almost um relevant and valid but almost an ideological response in this regulatory moment where governments welcomed platforms and the the early heady days of web 2.0 and we were all making fun things and it was all exciting and then they went oh no this is no good at all and they've 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 flipped the switch and i think with with that one of my i've, I've kind of got two points here one is that i think platforms are actually complex and unique businesses and i think we, it's risky to, to to put them all in one basket and i think we've seen that with the news media bargaining code there was an expectation from regulators that platforms and news were sort of inexplicably tied together. Mm. In fact, what we've seen is Google has a very strong financial interest in securing news, and Facebook maybe not that interested. The Wall Street Journal yesterday has said, and obviously these rumors have circulated for some time, that Facebook is considering getting out of news entirely. I'm increasingly starting to believe that's more and more the case mm -hmm. suddenly then you've got a regulatory situation which australia is kind of set up and it's now going around the world where the money coming to journalism the expected bag of cash is actually only coming from one party except of, except of two so i think in that respect i've always seen these kind of interactions between platforms and publishers for example so much more dynamic mm -hmm. and setting up regulatory and i think you know europe is a really good example of criteria based regulation that that you know doesn't doesn't necessarily target actors and even though the australian legislation obviously doesn't name names i think it was pretty evident from the policy discussion that google and, and facebook were in the crosshairs um that being said i think um there's also a need uh, broadly to, 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 to take a focus, and I think that's true of scholars as well as regulators, to look at the actual empirics and the data around these interactions. And I think we'll find that a lot of these capital P platforms have much more dynamic and diverse range ways of engaging with markets. Um, I've got a manuscript under review at the moment where I say platforms a lot in the book i want to try and not say that word again i'm sure i'll struggle with that but i think the more specific we can get the better mm -hmm. thank you um i, I want to leave time for questions but i want to just throw a question out to the panel to think about while we take audience questions which is if you could sort of wave a magic wand and say you would love to see research on a particular area where you feel there's a gap or where you know something empirical some evidence-based data would be really helpful to move this discussion along what what's your sort of wish list uh, maybe someone here in the audience one of the phd students might take that up so that's your wish list and we'll, we'll take questions if people have any there's one here and if we have time i want to come back to hai ching about the influence of the china model in the region uh, hi, uh, I'm Arjun. I'm a PhD student at QUT. And um, as I listen to uh, the speakers present their cases from specific countries, uh, inevitably I thought of India and especially the case of uh, Reliance Geo. Uh, so for those who may be unfamiliar, Reliance Geo started off as, a, as an internet mobile service provider, uh, which is also owned by India's richest person. Uh, today, it's, it's evolved to be much more than that. It has 400 million subscribers and growing, uh, India's largest internet service provider, but also has this super app, which, uh, which perhaps deals with everything from um, your, gross, your groceries to uh, entertainment, streaming to sports. And uh, it's especially curious because Reliance Geo is homegrown, but it has investment from from Facebook, Google, Microsoft, 
Intel. So it's, it's almost like all the fangs rolled into one in India. And, and so far, they've been able to navigate the, the regulatory space in India fairly easily. And um, because they aren't a traditional monopoly, but they are a super monopoly. So I just wanted to ask the folks, especially at the Digital Asia Hub, if you if you studied the case of Reliance Geo, uh, and also if and on also how regulatory agencies uh, need to innovate to tackle super monopolies, which might be more pernicious than your regular monopolies. So yeah, that's my question. Thanks. Let's take a few more, and then we can start responding to them. One at the back there. Yeah. Uh, hi, um, Fiona Haynes, University of Melbourne. Uh, just a very simple question. Has there been any thought of using competitive new neutrality principles in terms of funding the regulation? So, you know, it seems that it, it's, it's a concept from the 1980s, but, you know, that, that companies are responsible for the cost of their own regulations because the externalities are their, are their fault and therefore they should pay for the regulation for controlling those externalities. And it, it was not successful in some areas, but quite successful in others. So I just wonder if it's just completely fallen off the radar or not. Thank you. Any more? No? Okay. Do you want to take the competitive neutrality? Because Yaksu has a lot of <laughs> economics background, so I hear the word externality and I think, okay, that's all yours. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a very interesting idea. And, well, in the case of Korea, the traditional broadcasting industry uh, broadcasting companies are supposed to pay their dues uh, uh, for, well, generally speaking, uh, public interest. So they pay quite some amount of money every year. Um, and this money is used for like general literacy or uh, to, you know, uh, uh, set up antennas, for example, in remote areas in that kind of purposes. Um, well, how, whether it served its purposes well, that itself is debatable. Um, but more difficult question nowadays is about uh, being blurry uh, in this area. So, um, for example, traditional broadcasting companies nowadays are making complaints uh, saying that we are making contributions uh, for these public funds. Um, and on the other hand, for example, Google, Microsoft, uh, or Facebook, they are not making contributions. Or for, uh, the Korean companies, Naver or Kakao, they're not making contributions. So um, how to delineate uh, which company to make contributions for this uh, uh, self-sustainable uh, uh, manner, that itself is nowadays very difficult to uh, uh, you know, make uh, in, uh, and, and come up with social consensus. Uh, Thank you. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that question? Um, just one sure, point. Please. Um, just yesterday I saw a report on uh, ethics in AI and how that can be implemented uh, in the world. And the one line that caught my attention was uh, the difficulty of uh, applying AI ethics in uh, platform economies uh, because of the platform's ability to employ people who know how to dress up their so-called compliance with the regulation so they can, when they talk to the government regula regulators. But I'm just thinking when you were talking about the third party, there has been a call in platform governance saying that why don't we have a third party neutral, non-governmental, a non-commercial organization as a regulatory body. So financing is one thing, where do you get money to finance? But also another is that big corporations have so much money to employ really clever people to dress up their reports, to comply with all the policies. But in reality, do they? You know, from the report on AI ethics, I, you know, it, the picture is not that positive. Mm. I don't know. 
I, I wonder also the second they start contributing whether people then say the regulation is captured, mm. right? I mean, there's also that risk. Karen, I wonder if you want to jump in here also about this, this question and how you finance uh, fixing the problems that the platforms have created. I think the financing is, as mentioned, one point, but I think it's also important that we we look at the regulation as more than just the commercial companies and the governments. If we look at a body such as the, the Internet Governance Forum, uh, which is linked to the, U, uh, the UN and is also sort of multi-stakeholder, I think this is part of the way to go. And one of the things that we've been advocating in, in the Digital Services Act is transparency because, I mean, trust is sort of the end goal, but we, we can either have a sort of control-based way of regulating or a transparency-based way of regulating. And I think enforcing transparency on the way that data is used, the way that the algorithms are uh, set up, is a better way than, than trying to control it. And I think allowing for transparency and openness uh, towards regulators, but also that academics and journalists and civil society can have access is important uh, for the enforcement because I don't think that the government agencies, regulators and legislators will have the resources or uh, understand tech in capital letters uh, well enough to do this on their own. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, if we come back to the geo question very quickly, um, I think what you're bringing up also raises the question of political will to actually want to regulate. And I think part of something like geo highlights how this can play into larger nationalistic, jingoistic ideas of saying, we, we have a historic sort of trade war or, and which is getting exacerbated and there's the sort of India, China, we want to cooperate, but we also want to be frenemies. Um, what happens when there's a super app phenomenon, China is really big, China's uh, platforms are huge, super apps, you know, sort of originated in China and have trickled through. Maybe you want to leave space in the market for an Indian super app to actually have enough traction without inhibiting it uh, as part of your competitive advantage in, you know, the sort of geopolitical space. So I think that's one question of whether there's even a desire to regulate somebody like a geo, which also has the ears of the government and is very closely aligned with the ruling party. So uh, it, it can have a lot of space in which to innovate before people come in and uh, expect it to comply with regulations that they're imposing on Twitter, on Google, on everyone else. Uh, maybe they have a little more runway, uh, but uh, I don't know, if Dave, if you want to also jump in on that. I think one, one point that I'd highlight is, you know, you mentioned they have Google and Facebook as investors now. I think similarly look at the Chinese case where Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu in the early days all had investment from, you know, overseas uh, investors. And I think the sort of, again, they're just in a long list of, of platforms and the sort of transnational capital behind them. Um, and I think, you know, definitely in India, I think going forward, you may see the idea that, you know, as Geo gets bigger and bigger, and if they do fulfill their ambitions, which are very large, and I think today, while they have a large base of users, as far as like, the users of their super app or users of their, of their softwares are, are not that high yet, but I think if they do sort of reach the level, they're probably taking the bet that just like the Chinese companies, like Alibaba eventually bought back, bought Yahoo, you know, sort of turn the, you know, turn the role, reverse the roles completely. So I think they sort of see as, you know, Geo then could potentially, you know, as Malvika said, take advantage of the domestic, uh, uh, you know, rhetoric for sort of localization, and then eventually maybe even, you know, buy back or, you know, become more Indian and, 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 and kick the Facebooks and the Googles out. Um, although India is different from China in that sense. Uh, I think like those are the two points that come, come to me. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions, so maybe we'll just do a final round of comments from everyone. Either your wish list for research in this space or anything else that you wish you'd said earlier and didn't. This is your chance. We'll start with James and go down this way, and then we'll, we'll end with Karen. You can have the last word. 
There we go. I think, um, yeah, for me, I think really just more empirical data about the relationship between news media and platforms. I think despite the kind of regulatory activity that's occurring and soon to occur, I think over the next year we'll see more. Um, despite, what you know, the ACCC is a really wonderful regulator and they've done some really excellent work. But I think um, there is a focus on the now and I think some more stories, not just of the long durée of this relationship, but also what happens next, I think there needs to be continual work on this relationship because I'm not necessarily sure that what we're regulating now is going to be the case into the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think. Um, okay, what I want to add is, um, you know, the Chinese regime of platform governance follows the so-called global trend, uh, but at the same time, it, it signals what democratic, democratic elected governments should not do. Mm -hmm. uh, because the Chinese regime of platform governance in the name of data security and the personal information protection strengthens the party's power. Mm -hmm. So as we see more centralized power, the super agency without any constraints, uh, that is in contrast to the value that um, the countries in the West, uh, like Australia, hold. Uh, hold. Uh, so we would like to see when it comes to platform governance, more decentralized mm -hmm. approach. Uh, be aware of the danger of the centralized power of any particular agency or entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really useful to remind us. Thank you. Haksu. Um, yeah, um, all, well, from regulatory perspective, one big research agenda item that's on the table would be uh, how to regulate uh, uh, platforms or super app, for example. Uh, and what I'm referring to is, um, again, coming back to this big blurred uh, phenomenon that we are encountering. So, um, traditionally, uh, regulation has been done typically uh, based on kind of silo in, a, in the sense that boundaries among different industries are relatively clear, but nowadays uh, the boundaries are not uh, as clear as before. And uh, some people now talk about regulations based on functions. Uh, so if a platform provides uh, a payment service, then uh, a financial regulator can come in. Uh, and now you can ask a question. Uh, our company is uh, basically a media-based uh, platform company. Now, well, we, can, we have to report to uh, media regulator and at the same time financial regulator. Uh, so, uh, from the company perspective, there, there could be multiple uh, regulators out there. Would that be the natural direction we are headed? Or we need to find a third way of, uh, of finding uh, this regulatory avenue or regulatory authority? Mm -hmm. I think that's also useful because one of the things we're seeing with automation is it's not people being made redundant, but it's particular tasks that are being automated, so it's more granular. So I think what you're saying is look at the services rather than who they are uh, is, is really important. Um, Karen? Thank you very much. Um, I think having diversity and decentralization both in, in regulation and in enforcement is really crucial. Uh, however, we also need to have the size and the clout in order to make sure that this is actually properly enforced. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to have a sort of wish list for research, it would be on the, the user experience and the sociology of um, interacting with digital solutions because you can have, for example, in AI, you can have human oversight, but if the, the human that is providing the oversight doesn't have the, 
the experience of feeling that they can say no or yes when the computer says otherwise, then it's it's a moot question to have human oversight if it's not actually effective. And also if you have traditional media interacting with uh, social media platforms that tailor their content in order to for it to be more clickbaity and have more reach, then it's not really a difference whether you have sort of traditional media or social media, if they're all acting in the same way. And I think this is part of what we we haven't really gotten our heads around, both as media and as legislators, is how the digital is different also in the way that we as, as people interact with it. And thank you very much for an enlightening discussion today. Thank you. So I'll just thank all of our panelists and I want to thank Dave as well for helping to put this together. And it's, like we said, this is the first of five or six roundtables we're doing as part of our platform futures. The next one is on consumer welfare and rights with Consumers International on the 30th of August, but everything else is going to be on our website. And thank you all for making it till the end and have a good evening. Bye. Thank you.